meeting with the Secretary of Agriculture, so I'm going to have to be done by 1.15, so uh, we should make that without any problem. I got it from uh, Our final panel today uh, is uh, Stephen Brown, uh, the Senior Vice President of Government and Technical Affairs of the uh, AOPA. Welcome. James Coyne, the President of the National Air Transport Association. Welcome. And Paul Fiducia. President of the Small Aircraft Manufacturers Association. Uh, I want to thank you all for preparing today and being with us. Uh, as you've probably heard, it's custom of the Government Operations Committee uh, investigative hearings to swear in all witnesses. Do any of you have any problem with that? Not. Uh, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Certainly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all of your statements will be entered in the record uh, in their entirety, uh, so you can summarize and editorialize based on what you've heard uh, here today, and uh, we appreciate you being with us. Mr. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I am Steve Brown, Senior Vice President uh, for the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association. As the Chairman knows, we represent 330,000 individual aircraft owners and pilots, and that's about two-thirds of all of the general aviation pilots in the country. Mr. Chairman, in our view, uh, the concept of free flight will require two fundamental changes to occur in our aviation system. First, emerging technology such as LORAN-C and GPS for navigation will have to be certified and successfully deployed by the FAA. Uh, as a pilot, I think you know that uh, GPS is widely available. Units that are very light and compact, such as this one, uh, are now available for far less than $1,000. And those that are not portable, as this one is, but rather installed in the cockpit of a general aviation aircraft, are available for three or $4,000. So this kind of technology has become affordable in general aviation, and this kind of navigation capability will enable at least half of the benefits that we talk about under free flight to become widely available in our aviation system. The second key factor, though, that must occur and FAA must develop in order to have the concept of free flight become a reality in our airspace system is the automation capability within the air traffic control system. And it's that area that I think we need to focus our attention. For all users to be able to fly customized or user-preferred routes, uh, it's going to require a great increase in the computing capacity that FAA has to resolve conflicts and deploy the technology that they need to ensure safety in the system. In our view, as a result of this, uh, free flight will require a higher degree of air traffic control automation than FAA has been able to achieve thus far. Uh, and there's been testimony earlier today, as you know, about AAS and the other software problems that FAA has encountered thus far. For us in general aviation, though, the news is good uh, when you think about how we fly and the flight patterns that are most important to us. General aviation pilots and aircraft owners fly about 62% of all the flight hours in the country. And we fly 75% of all of the flights we make in VFR conditions. As a pilot, you know that essentially what this means is we access the airspace in an unrestricted way and fly essentially a user-preferred trajectory and flight path when we're operating VFR. So 75% of general aviation has those benefits uh, when they can fly in good weather conditions like we have today. However, 25% of general aviation flights are in the IFR system and are flying in methods and patterns and under procedures similar to those used by the airlines and therefore, in that case, have a far less efficient flight profile, as has been testified to earlier today. And so it's clearly that part of general aviation that would benefit dramatically from the concept of free flight if it could become a reality in our airspace system. Almost all of FAA's navigation uh, technology programs are on track, on schedule, and on budget, and are heavily supported by other congressional appropriating committees. However, in contrast, most of their automation programs are exceeding planned budget levels and, in fact, are delayed by many years. Uh, as you've heard this morning, uh, in our view, the AAS program is in complete disarray and its future, future prospects appear bleak at best. FAA has conducted reviews of the program and is trying to shake it up and repair the program, but the benefits that would have come from this advanced automation system appear distant at best. As you heard also in previous testimony, Mr. Chairman, and I'd just like to highlight this, Many of the software capabilities that are resident in other programs like ERA and TATCA and, and AMAS that require the integration of advanced navigation like GPS with new ground facilities and also new FAA computing capabilities have been slow in development and many are facing technology barriers. As pilots, therefore, we believe 
that the, the benefits of free flight may never materialize if, in fact, we cannot achieve some higher level of air traffic control automation. There's one other element that's important that I'd like to stress to you uh, that I think hasn't been emphasized adequately uh, enough, at least from a general aviation perspective in earlier testimony. Communications technology also will have to be updated. Uh, you heard about data link earlier today in testimony uh, when the airlines and FAA spoke on this issue. And what's important to remember is that while data link exists today, uh, we will need a more capable, higher volume data link system to do many of the things that would enable the free flight concept. Certainly that's achievable. And as was mentioned by FAA, there are prototype programs underway. But the key thing that's important for general aviation is that this data link capability be affordable and be able to be installed in general aviation aircraft. Clearly the air carriers can spend higher levels of funds uh, on this type of equipment, but for general aviation to participate in a data link system, we're going to have to have lightweight, small, affordable avionics, not unlike we have in navigation, in the communications arena as well. One particular group that works very closely with FAA on many of these areas is RTCA, the Radio Technical Commission for Aeronautics. Last year, RTCA published a 200-page document, which I'll leave for the committee if you're interested. Uh, it's entitled, The Transition to Digital Communications, Urgent Needs and Practical Means. And it made recommendations to FAA on just how this achievable and affordable data link transition could be made for all users, general aviation as well as the airlines. We believe that FAA should follow up on many of those recommendations and act on them uh, similar to how the members of the committee this morning were pressing FAA to do additional research and implementation in this area. Lastly, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to highlight the fact that while technology is a key part of the future system that would enable uh, flight, uh, free flight to occur in this country, there are a number of capacity increasing programs that FAA has developed and has formed recommendations on in concert with users that offer immediate capacity increases in the system. Those have been formulated at specific major airports and at reliever airports in urban areas of the country. Those particular capacity increasing items are things that are relatively simple and cost effective and they come from items like runway extensions, taxiway construction, ramp, lighting and navigation system improvements at major airports. However, in many cases, these projects are stalled by local politics and by zoning decisions that are often not made. So I hope that this committee could help us in not only pursuing the kinds of capacity benefits that exist in the concept of free flight and additional air traffic control automation, but maybe some of the more near-term items that could be done very quickly that are already on the books at FAA uh, in many of the other capacity areas. In summary, Mr. Chairman, the user preferred routes or free flight uh, offer cl clear economic as well as operational benefits for both the airlines and general aviation, but they're currently hostage to some of the technology development that FAA has underway. And the implementation of advanced navigation as well as communication and air traffic control automation all must occur together before flights in the national airspace will see dramatic time, fuel, and distance savings benefits. Those aircraft that fly IFR are the key beneficiaries. Whether they're airline, military, or general aviation, it's the IFR system that we're really talking about, and thank goodness we have free flight in the VFR system. So in spite of these technology challenges, uh, general aviation would clearly benefit from the increased capacity and operational savings uh, that come available in the near term. And as I said, I hope that the committee can help us pursue uh, more finite and detailed capacity increases as well. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> I appreciate, appreciate you being with us. Uh, Jim Coyne, welcome to the committee. And, uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's an honor to be with you today as you investigate changing Federal Aviation Administration systems, procedures, and related research and development programs to promote and foster free flight within America's airspace. Your investigation is timely and provides hope that recently developed technology can increase safety, reduce costs, and enhance efficiency for all elements of our nation's aviation industry. My name is James Coyne, and I serve as president of the National Air Transportation Association, representing the interests of nearly 2,000 aviation businesses across America, large and small, that sell, charter, supply, service, and repair aircraft of all types, teach our citizens to fly, and operate airport-based facilities, FBOs, in cities, towns, and counties across the country. Our members are, in essence, the service infrastructure of aviation in America. I also speak personally as a private pilot 
who has been flying for 20 years, visited 48 states by private aircraft, and become intimately aware of the strengths and weaknesses of our ATC system. And finally, as a former member of Congress, I appreciate your committee's important oversight role and the potential significance of your investigation into this issue. Let me first begin with a prediction. Simply put, free flight is the future of aviation. The question is not if, but when. Furthermore, the question of when will depend most of all on the actions of Congress. Only Congress can overcome the natural tendency, which we heard earlier today, of the FAA, like any large bureaucracy, to resist radical change for as long as possible. As long as the FAA controls our airspace, it will prefer the status quo, although I suspect it will be willing to study free flight for decades. Congress, unfortunately, will be listening to its constituents, the users of controlled airspace, who increasingly will come to understand the advantages of safety, cost, and efficiency that free flight can provide. Already, the aviation community understands the technology of free flight, understands the inherent logic of autonomous cockpit-based cockpit control, and understands the tremendous economic and human advantages that free flight offers. Before long, such advantages will be obvious to everyone. When analyzing any proposed change in our nation, national aviation system, the first question should always be about safety. NATA supports free flight for many reasons, none more important than because it will improve safety. Our, of course, our skies are already safe, and they've been getting safer for decades. But recent statistics show that the long improvement in aviation safety has begun to level off. We seem to have reached a plateau using current technology. Free flight will help us move aviation safety to a higher plane. It's analogous to the difference between a free market economy and a controlled economy. The free market economy succeeds because thousands of well-informed individual consumers can collectively make better decisions about the goods and services they want than some omnipotent, though well-meaning, decision maker. In a similar fashion, thousands of pilots with up-to-date information about the weather, their plane's performance, the potential conflicts with other aircraft, can provide better control and routing for their plane than a handful of omnipotent controllers. Free flight will allow them to access the information that is most important to their safety and give it to them sooner so that they can avoid problems long before they become serious. Free flight will assist pilots with their two greatest safety concerns, bad weather and equipment malfunction. The current system often limits a pilot's ability to respond quickly and decisively to changing weather conditions. Too often, a pilot facing uncertain weather decides to plow ahead following a routing that may take him into turbulence, ice, or worse. Similarly, when something suddenly goes wrong with the airplane, it's better to have all the data you need to find a safe haven at your fingertips so that the, so the pilot can fly the airplane rather than get distracted by potentially confusing conversations with controllers. Of course, nothing that I say should infer that all of us in aviation don't appreciate the often heroic efforts of controllers assisting planes that face an emergency of some kind. But just as you may appreciate the policeman who offers assistance with a flat tire, you wouldn't have wanted to have, get to have gotten his permission first before pulling off of a crowded freeway. Safety will also be enhanced in a free flight system that includes TCAS or TCAD, that is, uh, traffic collision and avoidance displays or systems, for all aircraft by improving aircraft separation, especially at uncontrolled fields or in areas where IFR and VFR traffic coexist in significant numbers. The second primary reason NATA supports free flight is because of the potential it offers to increase efficiency and reduce costs. Aviation, after all, is designed to save time. Free flight will shorten the length of almost every flight, saving time and money. For example, when President Clinton flies in Air Force One to Martha's Vineyard next week, if he were an ordinary system citizen, he might be routed hundreds of miles out of his way to the west and north of New York City. A free flight route to the vineyard could reduce his airtime by as much as 30 percent. Not all savings would be as dramatic, but even if the average time save was only 3 to 5 percent per flight, the total saving would be hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars per year. Considering, the cost that almost every considering that the costs of almost every airplane are calculated in hours flown, 
from $30 or $40 per hour for the smallest planes to up to $5,000 or to $10,000 per hour for the largest, free flight will give every aircraft owner or operator and every airline passenger a significant reduction in travel costs, not to mention the economic benefit of getting to a destination sooner. Finally, free flight will make flying more affordable and easier to learn. Most instructors acknowledge that flying would be more attractive to students if it wasn't so difficult to get an IFR rating. Free flight would make IFR flying simpler and safer, thereby increasing the ranks of qualified student pilots. In addition, it would encourage the development of a new generation of technically advanced aircraft of all sizes, fostering employment, exports, and a renaissance within the aviation industry. The display that you recently saw earlier today showing individual planes on a TV size screen, 5,000, very significantly distorts the, the potential of free flight. We're not talking about putting 5,000 planes freely on, this, on one TV screen, but think of it as the entire U.S., a huge amount of airspace, 11 million cubic miles of airspace, in which there are today at most 5,000 IFR planes at any one time. That means we're talking about 2,000 square miles per plane, 2,000 cubic miles per plane. We have the space, we have the time, we have the technology to make free flight available today. This is not something that's going to, that should take 8 to 20 years to create. This is something that can be done literally this week. You've seen proposals before you to provide free flight as an option for airspace above 37,000 feet today for commercial aircraft. Such a proposal could be implemented within a matter of months. Furthermore, all airspace above 18,000 feet, the so-called positive controlled airspace, could be made available for, for free flight easily within a year. So with this committee's direction and the support more broadly of Congress, we think that free flight can be made available within a matter of only a few years rather than decades, as you have heard earlier. In short, your committee's encouragement of free flight could be one of the most significant developments in aviation since the development of the radio. Computerized cockpits, data-linked GPS, moving maps, expert systems to identify traffic conflicts, downlinked and uplinked real-time weather, and advanced airport traffic and sequencing techniques are the future of American aviation. This hearing, hopefully, will lead to positive steps by the FAA that will make this future a reality sooner rather than later. America deserves to lead this era of aviation just as it has led in all earlier eras. That, in the final analysis, is up to you and to the rest of Congress. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Appreciate um, those remarks. And last uh, but not least, we have um, Mr. Paul Fiducia from the uh, Small Aircraft Manufacturers Association. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and member of the committee. I'm Paul Fiducia, president of the Small Aircraft Manufacturers Association. SAMA is a national trade association representing 40 producers of light general aviation aircraft kits and of piston engines, propellers, avionics, and other components. SAMA's members produce kits for the production of experimental aircraft, which today constitute about 10 percent of the general aviation fleet and are the world's largest source of new general aviation airplanes and rotorcraft. These aircraft include the most advanced civil piston engine aircraft ever produced with cruise speeds over 300 knots, incorporating the latest NASA-generated laminar flow aerodynamics made of graphite and other advanced materials and employing the latest avionics. General aviation as a whole, including piston engine-powered personal and business transportation airplanes, is an important element of the national air transportation system. GA comprises 95 percent of the civil fleet, flies 80 percent of all trips, conducts 75 percent of all air traffic operations, flies 60 percent of all hours, 40 percent of all miles, and carries 20 percent of all air passengers, and it does this in only 6 percent of all aviation fuel. General and commercial aviation have the same basic requirements for safe and efficient operation. Accurate navigation systems, real-time onboard information on hazardous weather and potentially conflicting traffic, and the ability to use this information to fly the safest and most efficient trajectory. However, there's currently an anomaly between the equipment capabilities and the operational rules for air carrier aircraft and our advanced light general aviation aircraft. Air carrier aircraft are superbly equipped today. 
You have real-time weather information in the cockpit, cockpit displayed collision avoidance information, accurate position information, and sophisticated flight management systems to use this information to determine the most efficient trajectory for their flight. However, the current concepts of air traffic control do not permit them to use this equipment to maximum advantage because of the inflexible clearances they must follow. Air carriers and other IFR operations are concentrated on the airways, creating congestion and delays and often bringing the system to a complete standstill when these airways are blocked by hazardous weather. Off airways, the sky is not crowded. As uh, Mr. Coyne just said, the presentation by the FAA may have been unintentionally misleading. Uh, I've never seen a 50-mile diameter airplane, and that's what we're looking at on that screen. They're also all presumably at the same altitude. Um, in fact, if that uh, presentation had been made to scale, you wouldn't have seen any airplanes. It would have been too small to see. On the other hand, light general aviation aircraft lack onboard weather and traffic information or flight management systems to calculate their best route. But when equipped with GPS receivers and moving maps is on the aircraft I regularly fly, under VFR, we can fly virtually any trajectory while receiving collision avoidance advisories through flight following services. This essentially is free flight. We are on trajectories, not on airways, and the controllers handle the separation routinely without any additional automation to do so, just as they do for IFR traffic deviating around bad weather. Free flight is an opportunity for the FAA to increase the capacity, safety, and efficiency of the national air transportation system by combining the best attributes of both commercial and general aviation equipment and operations. The FAA should enable the air carriers to exploit fully the advantages of their equipment and should encourage large numbers of general aviation aircraft to equip with affordable systems for providing onboard weather and traffic information and for broadcasting their position and weather data. To achieve these objectives, we recommend the following actions by FAA. First, the FAA should immediately conduct an operational evaluation of the free flight system as opposed by the testimony of Mr. Baeda. This evaluation should include both air carrier and general aviation aircraft, including light general aviation aircraft. It should be conducted on an expedited basis, employing currently available computer hardware and software, and should not be delayed until the system is 100 percent figured out, because that never happens. This evaluation process is the best way to determine how the system should be configured to handle both air carriers and GA. Enough is known now to begin this evaluation immediately. Second, the FAA and NASA should explore the creation of a cooperative industry government university project to demonstrate and validate the concepts of free flight, including onboard weather and traffic data applied across the entire spectrum of civil aircraft, meaning to extend these equipment uh, advantages to general aviation aircraft, and to investigate various low-cost equipment options and user-friendly operational rules to implement free flight. Free flight is the air carrier counterpart to a new program within NASA called the Advanced General Aviation Transport Experiment, which is to assist light general aviation in revitalizing itself, and the two programs should proceed cooperatively. Third, to maximize the benefits of free flight for both commercial and general aviation, the FAA should encourage the rapid voluntary purchase by most GA operators of GPS receivers, data link transmitters to minimize the size of the GA aircraft bubble, which will in fact determine how frequently controllers have to issue resolution advisories. This could be done by uplinking graphical weather data and surveillance radar traffic information, thus providing a large return on the GA operator's investment in this equipment. GA aircraft equipped only with mode C transponders are adequately equipped for the air carriers to operate under free flight today. However, if the GA aircraft are equipped with to broadcast their GPS-derived location, the increased positional accuracy will result in a smaller bubble around the GA aircraft, allowing fewer deviations by either GA or the air carriers than if the GA aircraft is only uh, operating with a mode C transponder. Once the GA operator has purchased GPS and a data link for his own navigation and weather and traffic information purposes, he's already equipped himself for GPS ADS transmissions to make this happen. In addition, GA can further improve the effectiveness of free flight by providing large numbers of airborne weather sensor platforms that are flying in the weather rather than above it, which can then data link this weather information down for included inclusion in the gridded database. This would improve the accuracy of weather now casting and forecasting to help air carriers determine what their best trajectory indeed is. 
Once GA is equipped with the data links to get the weather and the traffic information into their aircraft, the cost of additional equipment to send weather data down will be small and could be subsidized by the National Weather Service as a less expensive way to gather airborne weather data than the current radius on system. All of this is technically feasible now. Later this month, for example, RNAV Systems and Honeywell will demonstrate a data link system that accomplishes all of these functions that I've discussed above, plus company messaging. Next month, RNAV and Pan Am Weather Systems expect to have a general aviation weather and traffic information data link demonstration program operational throughout the state of Pennsylvania. What is required is FAA and NASA assistance to make this widely affordable and available. And we'll need the FAA's cooperation in getting the surveillance radar uh, information into the Pennsylvania program. SAMA strongly supports free flight and the vision presented by the Air Transport Association. General Aviation needs the technology that makes free flight possible to increase the safe utility of personal and business transportation flights and allow general aviation to reach its full potential in the transportation system. Free flight technologies applied to general aviation to result in increased national economic growth, foreign competitiveness of our aircraft manufacturers, and the resurrection, resurrection of a light general aviation industry in decline. In addition, it will increase the access of general aviation to the major airports. As was mentioned before, at O'Hare, for example, if you can put 180 flights an hour into the airport using free flight and there's 150 gates, that leaves 30 slots open for general aviation with no impact on air carrier operations. In developing and evaluating free flight, there are three principles that should be observed to ensure the full participation of general aviation. One, the technology must be able to accommodate not only the 6,000 air carrier aircraft, but also a much larger number of GA aircraft, such as the 200,000 aircraft in the current fleet. Number two, the data links and displays to implement free flight must be affordable by, by virtually all general aviation aircraft. And three, for a fast transition to free flight in its most useful form, the FAA must encourage GA operators to voluntarily equip their aircraft with these technologies by providing free weather and traffic data and the increased operational benefits of reduced separation sufficient to warrant the purchase of the GPS receivers, displays, and data links. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is an issue where this committee can make a big difference by immediately stimulating the FAA to do these things. The time uh, frames that they expressed in their testimony are typical but uh, unfortunate. I think that the air carriers have expressed uh, or exercised enormous patience and restraint they proposed a very cautious, phased-in program to evaluate this. Um, another response by the industry could be uh, an industry losing $3.5 billion a year uh, that could be fixed as simply and as quickly as this might be to direct their members to instruct their pilots to regularly declare economic emergencies. The discussion would go something like this. Washington Center, United 114, you're declaring an economic emergency. Payday, payday, payday. We're going to do a free flight deviation around severe economic turbulence and schedule icing where direct black altitude between 300 and 370, direct IAF at uh, LAX. That would be the SAMR approach. Probably wouldn't be the right one, but it might get things kicked off. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to commend you and the subcommittee for holding this hearing, for considering our views in this matter, and uh, we wish you success in stimulating the FAA to, to faster action. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, I think all of you um, gave uh, excellent testimony. It's too bad we we uh, <coughs> lost some of our audience and members, but uh, we'll try to <coughs> make sure that they're aware of, uh, of what you've uh, brought to us. Uh, I think that we're kind of uh, all of us are on the same wavelength here, uh, pretty much. And I, the question that I have is um, uh, that I'm not quite um, understanding is what this data link uh, uh, portion of this system is and what kind of cost we're looking at. Uh, uh, is, that, um, is that some kind of a, a separate box you need to put in the airplane? Or it is, but unfortunately it isn't, isn't a tremendously expensive box. Um, uh, currently, those uh, in the kind of quantities we're talking about for the Pennsylvania program are about $1,000 for what's called a modem transceiver. It's a two-way data link. Uh, that's going to be operating in a VHF frequency. They're in the uh, airlines now. They have these. 
airlines have data link. Uh, they have, as I mentioned, More all these things. They've got a system called ACARS that brings to them not graphic weather but textual weather into the cockpit. Uh, they have a system called MedCARS that transmits uh, weather information down to the ground. The air carriers, in terms of equipment, have all of this. Mm -hmm. GA doesn't. And what we're moving to now with the reductions in the cost of computers and displays and electronics, we finally have an ability that GA could realistically equip itself with these technologies. For the aircraft that are regularly flying IFR, <coughs> these technologies pay. And anyone who's flown GPS moving map will attest to the value of that equipment. So you'd, you'd have this data link, you'd have your GPS, and then you'd have one of these displays that you could put all this information in the cockpit. That's, that's what you'd have. That's right. The, the pilot should be <coughs> encouraged to voluntarily equip because when he purchases the GPS, he gets basically free flight if he can right. use it. When he gets the display, if you have data link and, and the FAA is providing weather and traffic information, now for the first time he can get ground-based precipitation uh, data from the mosaic of the radars. He can get ground-based lightning strike data, which is tremendously valuable in avoiding hazardous right. weather. And he can get uh, the ground-based surveillance radar. And the only that coverage is, is various on, uh, variable on the bottom, but it provided a kind of a low-cost form of TCAS to a wide range of pilots who can't afford TCAS systems, which are well beyond the, uh, the cost of an entire GA airplane, in fact, in most cases. Mr. Chairman, I'd, I'd like to respond yeah. to your question about price uh, because it brings a bit of reality to all of these discussions. Um, this unit, which you're well familiar with, the portable GPS, uh, has come down in price dramatically, but the essence of GPS has been known and we've been working on it for about a decade. And it took about that long for the price to come down where it could really penetrate uh, the general aviation marketplace. A, a data link system that would be certified by FAA, not something that's available in another transport mode, would be significantly more expensive than $1,000 today probably on the order of ten to fifteen thousand dollars for the type of general aviation use that would be involved. Will that come down in the future? Absolutely. Uh, but today, to talk about numbers, those are some numbers that are real. And I think you know, Mr. Chairman, there are many aircraft that are worth that. Mm -hmm. So, And this display that, uh, that's apparently been being produced or there's prototypes or whatever, how much would that cost now under today? I mean, it, if it's available, what's the yeah. price of one the, of those? There are none that are certified yet, but uh, the projections are that you're looking at a couple thousand dollars for, for a very high-end display, for a very simple display that you'd find in a smaller airplane with a little less capability. Uh, you might be able to get in the thousand-dollar range. So they're not too bad. They're just no, they're not beyond They're like reach. a television screen, and the, what makes them work is the... Uh, the data link and isn't there right. some kind of computer in there too though or uh, there has to be a processor to go with it but that's well. not uh, a real expensive or complicated thing the, right. the, the pricing question is kind of difficult and and uh, I agree yeah. with Steve that currently a, a certified an uncertified data link that we're using in this test program doesn't have to be certified because weather information is not it's flight not critical right. and we can do that for about a thousand if it was certified it would be more like ten thousand and to when you start talking about traffic information, it's going to have to be certified. Right. So I wouldn't disagree with Steve that now it might be 10 needs to come down. A color display right now of a size where you can see much is $5,000 plus right now. But again, the prices on those need to come down. Uh, the purpose of the NASA program, or one of them, is to <coughs> enable the industry to get technology transfer to bring the cost of hardened, uh, environmentally uh, acceptable flat panel displays down to where GA aircraft can use them in large numbers. Uh, I, th I think your association and all of you maybe are working at trying to <coughs> to um, get a new concept in general aviation airplanes um, all the way through from power plants to to um, the avionics and, and I'm convinced that what we're going to end up with is some kind of a computer that's going to have all this stuff in it rather than having what we have now. Uh, can this <coughs> If you had this kind of a system, can can this be displayed on that computer that's going to be what you fly the airplane with, or is it does it have to be in a separate uh, display, or can they all be in one? Mr. Chairman, if I can answer a little <coughs> bit, uh, it can all be in one. One one cockpit EFIS or electronic uh, flight instrument system can display all this information. Typically, the one system, as I showed you out at Oshkosh will have a series of, of buttons around it, and you may press one button and get all your in engine instruments on that screen, press another button, 
get all the weather on that screen, press a different button, get all the conflicting traffic on that screen, press another button, have an artificial horizon appear on the screen. These can be very sophisticated. I think for general aviation, of course, at this point, they're, they're, uh, the, the, the prototypes that are developing allow a great deal of different information to be put on the screen. Uh, thanks, of course, to the low cost of flat uh, panel displays that have uh, come down so much in the last uh, decade. The important thing also, though, is not just, just to be limited by what is available right now and we've already seen. If, if anyone's going to be talking about 15 or 20 years into the future, uh, it's, it's frustrating to hear our government officials say that 15 or 20 years into the future, we might be able to have what is available today. Uh, but really, in 15 or 20 years into the future, we could have airplanes that literally fly by expert systems. Uh, the, the pilot gets into it, tells it where it wants to go, and the system, together with this kind of free flight capability, provides much greater uh, uh, flexibility and control and safety uh, for airplanes using the technology of, of 20 years in, in the hence. Okay. So uh, I'm pleased to look forward 20 years, but I, I don't want to look backwards when I'm talking about it. I, people that are, that are uh, in this business tell me that, that they think within five years, if everybody get out of their way, they could have airplanes that wouldn't need pilots. That's exactly right. They could right. take off and land, and, and, uh, well, and that'll, I, that's never going to happen never. because you would, you'd never get the American people to get on a plane that didn't have a pilot. But... Uh, but, I mean, literally, uh, that's where they think that they could get with this technology uh, without too much problem in five years. That's right. Uh, yeah, we'd, if we'd people would get out of their way. You know, we'd or, certainly like to keep a few pilots around, <laughs> <Yeah>. Mr. Chairman. <laughs> and I, I think, though, your, your point is well taken. I mean, the reality is that, uh, and you well know this, that in general aviation, the use of current technology in many cases in is in excess of what happens in the airlines. Right. The only trick is that it has to become affordable so it can be widely installed. One of the reasons that I've that I've never finished my IFR rating is that it's too slow, mm -hmm. and uh, it just slows me down so much that I I just fly VFR because it just saves me so much time, and uh, and I never get around to finishing my instrument rating, you know, uh, and it's um, it it's one of the things that we need to f I think it's going to happen out of all of this. It's going to make it simpler. Once we get this, these changes, uh, and if we can get these new aircraft designs in place, where we can make it simpler to fly these planes, we, we've got a flat panel display that that is uh, everything is there instead of having all these different instruments and all these other things that you have to figure out. Um, you know, I think it's, it's we're going to have an easier time getting people uh, into flying. They're going to feel more comfortable with it. Uh, it's going to be easier to learn how to fly and so forth. And, that's where we need to go, you know. Well, and, and with your assistance, we now have the promise of manufacturing in general aviation again. Yeah. Uh, we've had a, a barrier on that for so many years, and now we're going to see that kind of innovation in the avionics field. I hope so. Uh, I mean, if, if, if all that's going to happen, though, if, if that we're going to build 172s again, that ain't going to cut it. I mean, we've got to get uh, beyond that if we're going to actually get serious about getting people back into general aviation, I think, you know. Uh, and I think that's what's going to happen you know, because of groups such as yours. and Mr. Chairman, the reason we're <coughs> testifying today is because all these technologies that I discussed earlier are precisely the ones that will open up general aviation to a large segment of the populace that today correctly perceives the time and investment necessary to reliably and safely fly almost all weather operations and use an airplane as a transportation device. A pilot needs to know where he is, where the airport is, where the train is, where the bad weather is, where the traffic is. And VFR, you can look out the window and see it. What we're talking about is electronic VFR, and I think the air carriers are using the same term for free flight. Um, once you can do that, um, it becomes much more intuitive, and it just vastly shortens the amount of time that would take someone uh, with the need to travel to go from ground zero to being a competent pilot operating in the national airspace system along with air carriers and everybody else in a totally safe, reliable, predictable way. And these technologies would do that. And then what we have to do is we have to get a system where you can go rent an airplane and fly it some other place and leave it like you do with rental cars. I mean, it is impossible to get to rent airplanes in this current system because of insurance and everything else. you they, you got to get checked out. And by the time you get done goofing around with it, you've spent a whole day uh, getting ready to fly that plane. And what we need is some kind of a card 
where it's got all your information on what you can fly, and you just rent a plane, you stick the card in there, and it says, welcome, Mr. Peterson, and you fly the plane to wherever you go, and you leave it, and, and that's what we need, uh, a system that makes it simple to use, and, and it gets around all these obstacles that we have with insurance and ratings and all this other stuff, and, and I think, it's, I think it's, it's there. Again, if we can just pull this together, and I think all of you are working on this, uh, from what I've heard, uh, and that's where I'd like to see us go with this. If, if, so if this committee can be of any help, we're going we're to be, if I have anything to say about it. And uh, I'm excited. I think general aviation is right at the point where it's going to really take off. And uh, we could make this like driving a car if we do it right. Mr. Uh, Chairman, I think in many respects uh, you're absolutely right about that. And, and the one thing that I hope you'll watch for all of us in general aviation is that as the airlines and FAA get together and, and work out some of their difficulties, they don't, they don't uh, us. That, that whatever comes out of that, and we will participate as much as we can, is truly affordable for general aviation so that we're not locked out by price or procedure or any other element in the solution. Well, rest assured I'm going to be on your side on that. And, uh, well, I think we have if I may, uh, Mr. Chairman, one last point, and, and uh, I agree fully with your vision of the future here. Um, but right today, uh, we've got our work cut out for us because the, uh, the FAA uh, continues to uh, plod along on many of these uh, innovative thoughts that you've talked about. Uh, general aviation has never been more affordable uh, to the average American than it is today. General aviation has never been safer. Uh, and it has, uh, with the new technology, has made these planes simpler to fly than ever before. This is a message we have to get out to Americans, and we appreciate your help and the FAA's help in getting that message out. Well, I'm going to have to run and go see the Secretary of Agriculture about barley problems, so uh, I have to shift gears here. But uh, we appreciate uh, you uh, being with us, and uh, we're going to we're going to follow up on this and keep their feet to the fire, and hopefully we can get that eight to twelve years down to. Eight to twelve months, maybe. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Subcommittee's adjourned. <clears throat> Representative Colin Peterson of Minnesota chairs the House Government Operations Subcommittee on Employment, Housing, and Aviation. This hearing was called to examine the FAA's use of technological advances. Wednesday morning on our companion network C-SPAN, a call-in program with Dana Priest of the Washington Post. She covers health care reform.